health reports and everything along those lines. I also do enforce EMTALAs, so I am very well versed on what the regulatory landscape is, as well as what is out there and what's happening and what's driving these changes ultimately for from a CMS perspective, right? So when we talk about things, we don't we need not only understand where we are now, but we need to understand where we are coming from and where we are going. So from a CMS perspective, that's what I do day in and day out. And that's what I bring to the table here at CCM Health. Yes, uh, so we'll dive straight into uh, the heart of the subject. So chronic diseases are skyrocketing and are costly. Some numbers, so more than 120 million Americans have one or more chronic conditions. So that's one in three. Um, this is uh, something which has to be addressed because the, the costs are only going up. So Medicare is coming up with uh, Medicare and the federal government and, and the legislative bodies. They are coming up with different um, strategies to tackle that problems. So like for instance, half of more than half of hospitals had penalties for readmission in 2019. And this is uh, 2019 is, is, is before the, the pandemic. Uh, two thirds of healthcare spending in the US uh, is for chronic conditions. And uh, five to 15% of patients only report having uh, some kind of care coordination or management. So there's a lot of work still to be done to address the chronic uh, diseases. Uh, if we want to, to have a more efficient and a more, I would say, return on investment, uh, good return on investment, uh, health system going forward. So, um, and we will go into the more detail as to what we have as uh, our uh, product and our strategy to tackle these uh, issues. Uh, so with that, why? Like what has been happening? What is going on from a CMS perspective? One thing that you should be remembering from today is at least the AAA been the main driving force of U.S. healthcare in the last decade at least. So AAA just means we need to be delivering better care at a lower cost, all the while improving the patient experience. I mean, if you look at it from a broader perspective, U.S. ultimately spends the most amount of money in the world on healthcare per capita, but we don't get the benefit. Uh, from an OECD perspective, we are typically in the middle of the pack. So, I mean, we are spending so much money but not that getting the return. So something has to be done. And that's what the federal government is trying to be doing. So ultimately, there's been a lot of key legislative legislation here. One of the main ones was ACA, the Affordable Care Act or the Obamacare. It is here to stay. There's been lots of challenges, but it's been the law of the land for at least the last 10 to 12 years. And it is here to stay. They, there is also some ongoing changes with regards to healthcare payment and delivery system reforms, as well as the health insurance reforms. But ultimately, the goal is to give people a better care, lowering the cost, all the meanwhile holding the providers that is you guys out there in the field responsible for the quality metrics. So basically, if you provide X, Y, and Z, you will need to show that that X, Y, and Z was good and uh, was timely and was efficacious. So two other things, and these are on our CCM Health webpage, the where we do deep down in these that are background to remote patient monitoring today are the MACRA and the MIPS, the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System and the MACRA that changed how billing and payments were provided to physicians out there and then associated with how people or physicians were going to be responsible for these payments and how quality played into all of these. So why? Why are we here? Why are we going to be talking about remote patient monitoring? Well, because it's a unique thing. It helps us reduce hospitalization and costs of care. It bridges gaps between chronic conditions, chronic care management, and it's really convenient for patients. That's at the end of the day, gist of it, right? That's why we got into medicine. We wanted to help patients. We wanted to do good in the world. And this is just a really good tool to help us achieve that. 
So studies back this up too. So basically, as uh, Dr. J as well said earlier on, a lot of hospitals as well as a lot of physicians are being penalized for patient readmissions. You may be sitting there thinking, well, it's not my fault that the patient didn't take their medication. You're 110% right, but there's still tools, including RPM, that we can use. For example, if you look, this was one of the major studies on this. Uh, when an RPM was used where appropriate, may it be for glucometer if they had diabetes or if they scale, if they had congestive heart failure, there were lower risks of readmission and lower ER visits. All right. Um, so as far as uh, for being the CCM liaison, I'm going to go into specifically what RPM means for CCM. Uh, we have two components in our RPM uh, program, blood pressure and blood sugar. And we use specialized devices, the blood glucometer and the blood pressure cuff. Um, we use cellular technology. So when the patient's taking their vitals, it's actually being transmitted live, the data to our CCM EMR. Um, of course, all providers have access to that CCM EMR, and I'm there, of course, to train them on it. Uh, I can remember a really good example where I had this provider where we, you know, he got to see like some of his patients' uh, uh, vitals, and he actually called that patient up and he's like, listen, your BP is a little high today. And what from what he told me, he just thought the interaction was just so awesome because basically the patient felt so, you know, cared for. He was like, wow, you're really checking in on me. And basically I'll call him Dr. Z for short, um, was really impressed by the fact that he's able to monitor his patients a lot more closely. And his patients, of course, were really happy that he was engaging with them more. So that's really what I wanted to highlight in regards to our RPM program here for now. So RPM, uh, how do we bring it together from a CCM experience, from our experience and what do we do for, in order for us to also monetize this, right? So that's gonna be an added benefit for the providers out there. So basically our need is to better manage the chronic care population, meaning those, especially living in higher risk areas, rural settings, older adults, etc. You may be saying, well, if it's an older adult, how are they really going to sort this machine out, use this machine connected to the internet, but we'll get there. So basically, one of the more intricate parts of this is, A, after defining the need, who you're going to include. So like patients with a chronic condition, patients who have a lot of hospitalization, who are not really compliant, uh, and then what's going to happen? So as uh, Dr. Je, Dr. Friedel was saying, basically, if you notice something, what are you going to do? So you need a patient care plan. You need thresholds. You need questionnaires. You need patient training and setup, uh, as well as you need, you, you need an assistant to be able to sort all of this out. You need a guide. And CCM Health is here to route you through this all. Uh, some basics. So basically, uh, in order for you to be able to build remote patient monitoring, patient needs to be diagnosed with two or more chronic conditions. So they, I frequently get this question a lot. There is no set list of chronic conditions. It's a definition that CCM defines. And if you think it affects the patient and it's a chronic ailment, it is a chronic ailment. So it can be almost anything, but going forward, I think uh, we are also going to be seeing a lot of long COVID in the chronic condition. And if you're thinking, well, my patient has one issue or two issue, I can tell you studies commonly find that any elderly patient has at least four to six diagnosable conditions. Just because you don't know about them doesn't mean they're not there. So these devices need to be cleared by the FDA. And then ultimately, RPM needs to be ordered by a qualified healthcare professional. So again, from a billing perspective, there is really different codes, and this will depend on your patient population, on your staff, and what your goals with RPM are. But you will get paid for setting up you will get paid for data interpretation, and then you will get paid on a continued basis. These were last updated as early as last year, and uh, some of these codes were also valid to be used for COVID-19 patients and could be built more frequently. So there's just continued changes in that, 
but just all in all, know that you can outsource these as long as you are generally supervising what's going on and you can build it on a continual basis. Uh, same thing as an example, uh, I mean, for one patient, you can bill up to $150 every 30 days. So it's almost $1,300 per patient per year in net revenue for you. Okay, so what we're trying to convey here is that uh, in regards to setting up a CCM program, chronic care management program, it's a very costly thing to do on your own. And so here with CCM Health, we're providing the resources in order to create a more effective program for your practice. Uh, so the idea is that um, there's gonna be trained nurses. Of course, you will have a say if they're hired or not, there'll be interviews. Our CCM EMR technology you'll have access to as well, which I will show you how it's used. That's not just in regards to say remote patient monitoring, that's in regards to care gaps. We have a care gap system in which uh, if certain scenarios occur while our nurses are calling your patients, they're going to make you aware. I'll give you one example. An example would be something as simple as the patient um, hasn't seen your practice in over six months. So we will make you aware and then that patient can be scheduled for an appointment with you. So this does also help in regards to patient retention. Really important to have that as well. Um, so the idea is that you're gonna have a greater degree of control over your practice, which is a pretty big deal. So I can think of one small provider I saw, I think it was around seven months ago, where I presented the CCM program to this doctor. And uh, basically the doctor said, no, 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 I'm gonna do it all by myself. I don't need it. And I said, okay, you know, I'm not here to sell you anything. I'm just here to show you what we're doing. Um, with my due diligence, I actually looked back in on this provider and I found out that practice actually did close. Now I'm sure that wasn't the only reason that that practice did close. But I do find the fact that is you have to have an open mind and be able to adapt within the ever-changing field of healthcare. So that's just another example in which, you know, we're here to assist you. We are your hands, you are the head. So Dr. Dr. Ferdell, that's a very good point. I, I want to uh, go back to Dr. Erdik for a second. Dr. Mm. Erdik, uh, knowing that uh, in 2024, Medicare is going to be focused on making majority of its contracts at-risk contracts. Can you discuss how the compensation structure and reimbursements for, for healthcare systems and independent mm. providers are going to react and um, change over the course of the next few years? And where we are now as far as how much of the reimbursement, uh, if you are a fee-for-service or uh, if you're capitated and you have uh, at risk contracts is contingent on your clinical performance. Because I think what Dr. Jaiswal and what Dr. Friedel is conveying is the importance of controlling the clinical outcomes of your patient population that will have direct connection to the clinical performance on your patient population and how much money you're able to save to the systems. To the health of your practice. Sure. I mean, the main driving force uh, behind this is that. Medicare is on track to be insolvent in 2024. So as simple as that. If people are getting older, not more many people are buying into it and stuff is getting expensive. I, we, we, from a political perspective, there's a lot more reasons like Medicare won't bargain or talk or adjust for medication pricing, this and that. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. As you said, one way they figured they can do two things, uh, they can hit two birds with one stone, is these at-risk contracts, meaning they are pushing for triple aim at your dime. So if you're doing good, if you're preventing readmissions, if you're showing quality care defined by particular quality metrics, such as hemoglobin A1C levels, such as blood pressure control, such as people being on statins for cholesterol control, then you're most likely to be good. So you're most likely to be on the benefiting side of things. Uh, but if you're not paying particular attention to the quality you provide, that means you are going to be losing substantial amounts of money in the short term. Uh, and how CMS is trying to achieve all of this is by having people on the losing end of things paying for people doing good. So these are all ultimately designed to be sort of budget neutral 
particularly from a MIPS perspective, that if you are doing really good with your quality metrics, your increased payment will come from those that are doing bad. You may be asking, what are the goals? What goals should I hit? That's another issue here, is that most of these are moving goalposts, meaning you are actively being compared to what the average in your field is, what the average in your zip code is, what the average in your specialty is doing. So you need not only be doing really good, you need to be doing better than the comparable providers. So if everyone has their hemoglobin A1C under control for their patient population, but for whatever reason yours is not, then especially in the short term, you are looking for substantial payment penalties. If so, that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But let me just weigh in here for a sec. So uh, if I'm an ordinary provider, because if you don't to just take a provider that's been used to working, whether they're independent or they're working in the system, they're working fee for service, they're worried about patients and seeing patients and getting through their regular day. Everything that we're discussing here today seems like extremely complex process and they ultimately choose often not to even burden themselves with that thinking is going to be okay. But we, we know that isn't the case. So I, I want to bring up a few points that I'd like you to address. One is Medicare star rating. If, if your business is contingent on the geriatric patient population and if you have that how that star rating will reflect your contracting and will reflect the rate of that contracting. Because if you're not contracted well with your plan sponsors, you will be seeing lots of patients and you're ultimately we're going to see reimbursement that's significantly less than somebody who has thought about proper star rating and proper PBM or, or, or plan sponsors contracting. That's one. And two, understanding how the incentive works based on quality, whether you're submitting, whether it's capitated, and then, then you're looking at the quality measures that are going to give you additional incentives or penalties, or whether you're submitting for MIPS, because many providers are thinking, okay, so there's a COVID uh, exception, let me go ahead and just file it, but they're not looking at taking advantages of the incentives, they're worried about, will I, will I or will I not have penalties? So you got to look at MIPS as not only way of, of uh, how do I avoid the penalty, but also how do I in, improve the clinical outcomes of the patient population and actually receive an incentive on it. Um, can, you, can you weigh in, Dr. Erdik, please? Sure. So if you I mean, boil it down, make it very crisp and clean. Sure. So latest data, CMS has tied about 90% of their payments to value. And 40% of those flow through alternative payment methods, meaning ACOs or similar things. So whether you know you're aware, you like it, you participate, your payment is more than likely tied to value. Knowing that last two years, as you said, have been sort of freebies. So there's still data, but CMS did not act on it due to uncontrollable circumstances. But with the recent push as a society to sort of put the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic in the rear view mirror, the, this year, I do not think it's going to be a freebie. So this year, the hammer is going to start coming down slowly and slowly, and you're going to be held responsible for your quality metrics ultimately. So basically, to address the question you said, uh, it is not just sufficient to provide this data and then hope for the best. You need to be actively engaged with your patients, also simultaneously taking use of other billing opportunities CMS has provided to better manage your at-risk population, such as chronic care management and remote patient monitoring, because this is like a sort of like a GPS navigation that CMS is paying for and telling you, hey, why don't you use this to get better control of your patient metrics so I can pay you more? So at the same time, you also managing your chronic patient population, because ultimately CMS doesn't want to pay you more money, correct? But CMS also wants to help the patients just like you are. And they are thinking going forward, if we actively engage with these diabetic patients through chronic care management, through a... Uh, nurse that has access to remote patient monitoring, 
that we are going to be preventing hospitalizations, we are going to be preventing birth outcomes, maybe diabetic nephropathy or polyneuritis, uh, whatever they may be, polyneuropathy. Uh, so at the end of the day, these are here to stay. And whether you know you're in it, whether you think this doesn't apply to you, it does apply to you. And from a five-star perspective, from a MIP store perspective, you're actively being judged by CMS. And it is only a matter of time when CMS will start changing your payments because of the value you provide or you don't provide. Thank you. Yes. So I, I know that, let, I, I wanna kind of put, just put it out there. C -C 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 chronic care management or remote patient monitoring or behavioral health integration. I want to make sure that, that the audience understand that isn't the goal. The goal is population health. The goal is to improve clinical outcomes, reduce healthcare costs. And to do so, we go after the big ticket items, which is hospitalizations, which is readmissions. So it is way cheaper to pay, keep the patients in, in, on outpatient setting in the provider's office than to have them be hospitalized for a single day. And um, that is why we, we obviously we have the technologies, we have the human resources, but Dr. Jaiswal, your role is, is to screen for those potential partnership opportunities. I underline, we, we don't take everybody. Uh, we look strategically who would be a good fit. Could you describe who would be a good fit for us to have strategic partnerships with uh, based on your quality requirements? Sure. So, First and foremost is technology. So without EMR, it's a very basic thing, but there's still many providers out there that, of course, you know, of the older generation, but still, they still have maybe five years, maybe 10 years left, sometimes more, and they are resistant to, to switching. And that is an impediment because that's a, you know, it's a mine territory, uh, paper charts. There's so many care gaps that it's just because it's not accessible is not, it's not closable. So uh, th that's one thing, which is very straightforward. Secondly, you have to be paying attention to your quality measures. So if you have not even selected them, you cannot work on them. So we are already into end of March. They should have been selected for the beginning of the year. So it's also, you know, I, it's part of also, you know, the, the, the amount of workload out there, but you have to have a strategy. Let me, let me weigh in there for a second with you. So, so first one, you mentioned that it's very important that the provider uses electronic medical record. And if they don't, they need to be using it. Otherwise, there is no way to, to do the information exchange in an efficient fashion. So as we're going to be identifying problems, unless those problems are being addressed, which is going to have a direct impact to the patient's health, they we're being wasteful. So we want to make sure that, that uh, we advise you that if your practice uh, or your health systems does not have an EMR, we advise you that you seek and get one ASAP. And uh, if you do have one, but you're not using it to its full capacities, what does that mean? What's important? Important is making sure that you document your encounters and you're conducting your coding within your system. So you're reporting properly. If you're doing it on the paper charts and then you're scanning it in, that isn't good enough. Nobody's going to see it. It's ultimately like not doing it at all. So we, we do offer some guidance and some help and you can just you know tap on us and we'll, we'll try to point you in the right direction. But it is a crucial in order for your practice to thrive and to survive in the next coming years. So that 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 was one aspect of, of that. Um, as far as uh, setting up clinical protocols and, and, and having and being responsive, as we identify problems, yes, as the provider, you are responsible to make sure you close those gaps. Dr. J as well. Could you describe what we're looking for as far as a provider that's being responsive? So clinically, uh, the idea is to understand what is urgent, what is not urgent, but that is, of course, part of our training. But then you have to be able to 
share information and be responsive to 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 a request a request might be uh, to to have a patient come in to to take a look uh, what's going on with the hypertension what's going on with the diabetes things are less urgent than others other things are more urgent than others the idea is to be responsive we are not into clinical decision making that remains the responsibility of the provider but then when the information is fed back to you, you have to use it. And you will see that with population health, your work is kind of like distilled to what is perhaps the most important you have to take care of. Of course, there will be some redundant things, but the idea is when we show you the information, it's distilled information because there are nurses that have sorted through it there are physicians who work with the nurses, supervise some of the work. Uh, and then the, Dr. Friedel and, and myself, we, we make sure that you have the most pertinent information, but then you have to do what your part is to, to take the decision because we do not take any decision as far as uh, patient, um, patient um, care. We are your hands, you remain the brain. So you have to be responsive. Uh, that's very important. Um, just like the EMR, also collaboration on your part. There are, you know, we, I just went briefly over the quality measures. That's an area where Dr. Where, where Dr. Erdik is, is an expert. Uh, he can bring all his experience and his expertise to, your, uh, to you and to help you with quality measures selection, something we should have been done earlier in the year. And then we can go a little bit into the accreditations like for instance PCMH accreditation it's a quality uh, accreditation of the practice and as a whole it gives you step-by-step -step guidelines as to how to operate your practice so, so that it meets regulatory and uh, conventional quality care guidelines and it just brings the quality up as far as your practice patients and also reimbursement so you're looking at 5% of extra reimbursements because insurance companies, they, for them, you, ha you having that means you're doing quality work and you're rewarded for that. And it's we can help with setting that up because once you are set up, we can collaborate much better because we have the same quality targets to meet as far as you know our engagement with Medicare. We cannot operate in any way we have this if you will we, we are in the same boat as far as quality outcomes quality care patient outcomes saving medicare money at the end of the day medicare wants to tackle that because that's like something which is going more and more out of control the projection is that it's not going to get any better so any effort intelligent effort in that direction is welcome and technology is put at the disposal of chronic care now so we we are totally in line with that uh, so, thank you thank you i'm sorry to interrupt you uh, stan we yes. do have a question do you guys want to do questions now or would you like to wait until the end why don't we do this why, why don't i try to, to 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 summarize some of the things we spoke about and we will address all the questions in the end i'm sure we're going to make time let me just try to boil this down because I'm sure to a lot of the providers that are logged in today, this seems like a lot. It seems like it's complex and nobody knows where to start. And we, we do need to address kind of how we facilitate and we make things easier through Dr. Friedel's role mm -hmm. and, and helping through the implementation process. But let's just, let's just draw a picture of what a compliant, proactive provider or an infrastructure looks like. So if, and Dr. Erdik, uh, I'm gonna bounce this off you, but uh, if we're going to look at somebody who's ready for 2022, I would take the liberty and say, well, this is a practice that's either already accredited by PCMH or Joint Commission or, or similar. Uh, if they're not, they're in process, they understand the importance of it and they're in process of doing so because that's not only going to increase their reimbursement on the existing business, if we're looking at New York City, we're looking at Medicare, Medicaid, it's an additional 5%, um, as well as it'll help them to participate within plans that they may not have access to, is going to show a standard of quality. 
So either they're already accredited or they're actively looking into making sure that accreditation is filed for 2022. That would be one. Would you agree, Dr. Erdik? You, you are muted. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Yes, I think I would agree with what you said. Yeah. So that, 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 that's one. Two, uh, they understand and they know where they are, where, where, where they stand as far as their star rating, because let's think of their star rating as their scorecard, uh, which is going to be broken down based on their specialty. So they'll get a sense of kind of where they stand and they'll be thinking of the quality improvement initiatives to improve that star rating over time. And yes, it does not happen in a single day, but there has to be a very boiled down strategy in place of, of what they're going to do to make that better by completion of 2022. Would you agree? Uh, yes, one caveat being uh, these ratings and data, typically CMS releases are two years behind. Yes. So it might not be perfectly representative of what they are doing, but it's a good starting point. And as you said, it's like the grade card you get in school, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, just like Dr. Jaiswal mentioned, they have elected based on their specialty. And we know it's, it's a lot more than that as far as the MIPS planning, but they have elected their quality measures, which we can help with. And they're putting together strategies within their patient population of how to address those quality measures. But in order to do so, you first need to start by understanding data on your existing patient population. So we have to get away from the concept of thinking, okay, I'm going to just see my 10, 20, 15, whatever the number is patients per day. And I'm going to recommend what I'm going to recommend. And let's see what happens when they come back next. You have to take control and understand your population. What does that mean? Breaking down your patient population by age, breaking them down by uh, gender, breaking them down by disease states, breaking them down by risk factors, conducting risk stratification, understanding your hospitalizations understanding what you can do to improve and decrease those hospitalizations. Now, not all hospitalizations are preventable, right? Some of them are planned. Some of them are things that, that you can't do anything about, but breaking it down and understanding which ones are preventable, and which ones are not. So that initial step is something that we do very well. So if, if we think, and you guys think that we're a good fit and we proceed forward, we'd go through implementation of the first 30 days, the whole implementation takes about 90 days, but the first 30 days are very telling. What we do is we break down the patient population and then we put and embed clinical protocols in order to address at risk patient population. Dr. Friedel, can you describe that process over the first 30 days? So essentially a provider that, that doesn't have the infrastructure and the manpower internally, whether it's financial or human resources to implement this, how you and your team will assist to understand the patient population help enroll patients in, in population health initiatives and start looking at data and looking at strategies to address some of the gaps and work towards improving those gaps regardless of how big or small organization is. Gladly. Um, so one of the first things that we're gonna do is on the initial meeting is getting access to your EMR. Now it's been alluded before by um, Stan over here that you have to have that EMR because we need to find that data our CCMR is specialized. It uses machine learning in which it can actually sift through all your patient data, all your profile, and it's able to find certain patterns within that patient population in regards to risk and all that. So the initial idea is getting all the information you can get. You want to create that patient map. You really want that patient map because then you can kind of see exactly where you need to focus in on a certain subsection of your patient population. So that's really the first big main step. The second step though, of course, is finding those patients that are eligible for CCM, um, 65 years or older, two or more chronic conditions uh, with Medicare. Um, enrollment can take up to a month or two. It really depends. We're talking about compliance. I find my best clients are the ones that are never happy. They always wanna improve. They always wanna strive to be better. And they're always interacting with me when I'm talking with them. They're like, oh, I know this patient. Okay, this is what you need to do for this patient. I understand we're all busy. I understand we have a lot of things to do, but those clients that take the time with me talking about those patients that really need to be talked about are the ones that flourish within our program and do very well. So it really is a two-way street in which we meet halfway and we discuss exactly what needs to occur in regards to the patient population who we need to talk to. So, I mean, those patients that are always compliant, always doing well, of course, they're gonna be enrolled, everything's great. 
really the patients that fall through the cracks, the difficult patients, those patients for whatever reason, we can always chalk it up to non-compliance, but there could be all kinds of issues, social issues, uh, mental health issues, all these things. When we discuss that and figure out where we need to go, you're going to promote an overall better, um, what is the word, health for your overall patient population. It's a real big, big thing right there. So, so uh, Dr. Erdig, if you can just explain the moving target mm-hmm. um, in, in, in few words. So I'm going to f- formalize the question. Uh, providers based on their specialty uh, have uh, national benchmarks and uh, according to the performance of providers across the United States, there's a quality benchmark. Can you go over that a little bit? So the- oh, sure. So it's akin to a curve in your medical school grade. So let's say you have selected hemoglobin A1C control as one of your quality metrics. CMS compiles a list and it's going to score you on this, right? Let's say from zero to 100. So let's say that the average is 50% control. So if you did 50%, you'd get 50 as a score. If you did 100%, you'd get 100 as a score. So it's based on how other people doing and then it's like an applied curve on top of it. So if everyone is doing really good, then if you're doing bad, if you're doing two, three standard deviations below the average, then you're going to be looking at a zero. Everyone is doing really bad. But if you're doing two, three standard deviations above, even if you're in the broader scheme of things, not doing really good, you're only doing like 70, 80%, you're probably going to get the full score on that. Does that sort of answer the question? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think uh, we should give an opportunity for the audience to ask questions if there's any and we can discuss kind of the next steps and what would what would it look like if you do want to implement population health within your practice because there will be a one-on-one assessment. But let's go ahead and ask the audience whether they have questions so we can address them. Moderator, please. Yeah, so the first question is from Dr. Mandel. He is asking, is this helpful for an endocrinology practice in turn of reimbursement? So I, I would probably uh, have Dr. Jerry Swal respond first. Uh, as far as, as as reimbursements, oh, absolutely. This is going to be a huge aspect of your revenue stream. But before you think reimbursements, you need to think how important is this as far as clinical outcomes for an endocrinologist. Dr. Jerry Swal, if very sure. short answer, please. Yes. So, of course, you are like the the elite in terms of our providers reason being you take care of uh, diabetes and diabetes is the big big um, i would say a challenge uh, in new york city area around the country around the world even so that being said yes uh, you and the population that you serve are in need of chronic care management just because of the weight of disease. So hence yes you can benefit from population health and uh, clinically and second part, of course, your practice also will be able to uh, have a good, uh, you know, uh, receiving of those benefits, incentives that Medicare is putting out there uh, for chronic care management. So both, I think, yes, absolutely. So let me, this is a great question and let me weigh in there as well. Um, social determinants on health, uh, and this is something we're going to have a separate mm-hmm. Uh, webinar on, Mm -hmm. but uh, this is huge. If we're looking at New York, uh, it's almost like a... I was going to mention that. I was already thinking about it. EU on itself. Every zip code will be very, very different. It's going to be various cultures, various social and economic barriers. And uh, if you're going to look at Midtown Manhattan, you're going to have a prevalence of of diabetes of 5%. If you're going to look at East New York, you'll have 14.9%. Um, it's a battle of its own. So according to where you're located, it's going to be very important. Knowing the data on your patient population, making sure that if, if, so for you, for your patients, if there are remote patient monitoring and uh, whether they're your patients or you're getting a referral from an internal medicine doctor, if you have the correct readings and it's not coming on a bloody piece of paper, but it's coming in an electronic form, and that shows you the spikes, you're able to calibrate the patient's medication and improve and reduce their A1C levels over time. So I I think that you're going to find lots of clinical value. And again, please remember that CCM and RPM 
is not the goal. CCM and RPM is a tool for you to improve those clinical outcomes and yes, improve the financial performance as well. And reduce hospitalizations, which is important no matter what specialty you're in. I mean, it's like the navigation system CMS pays you to have to help you guide through these models. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I hope that answers the question. Moderator, please let yeah. me know if there's more. So we do, we do have one question from an attendee who um, chose to keep his name anonymous. It's actually a two-part question. The first one is, why should I start population health now? Why not wait six months or next year? <laughs> <laughs> so, so the, the answer is you could wait. Uh, I mean, it's, you got to consider that, that one, uh, a large segment of your reimbursement for your practice uh, is contingent on quality. So if you want to just delay quality for your patients, uh, I, I, it's unfortunate for your patients that you, that's, that, that's the option. And two, it's probably unfortunate for your reimbursement as well, because you'd be just delaying the incentives, but everybody makes their call and nobody will tell you what to do. The answer is you don't need to, you can wait. Yeah. There's also so, uh, just one point, very important, but that's with a lot of things in, 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 in medicine or in life. There's a learning curve to this, just like riding a bike, driving a car, uh, you can't like just get in, get on a bike and drive and ride or, or drives. It takes time. It'll take a few months before we are in cruise control mode. So it's like procrastinate. It's like that midterm, you know, you can study for it ahead of time and do well, or you can do an all nighter and maybe not even pass. Uh, so the idea is to look at it as something which basically now is the new norm is the new rules you have to basically just play by it so the idea is to embrace change i mean change is that's not necessarily the, is not necessarily something dr friedel and i <laughs> we, we, we 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 encounter, encounter those barriers yeah, yeah where people you know from what i see a lot it, it's just fear of that unknown fear of new technology you know and we will provide those tools but not just giving you those tools that's one of my main roles is providing support and education. That's what I'm there for. So you're not going into this alone is what I'm trying to tell you in regards to population health mm -hmm. and what we're doing. But we do. I mean, we see it all the time in the field. We'll see certain providers that, you know, they're just, they're just afraid. And that's yeah. totally understandable because, you know, discussing all this theoretical stuff that we have, it, it can be overwhelming. It can be very daunting, but, but that's why we're here. We're here to help and we're here to discuss. Yeah, we and to we want to, to be agents of change and mm -hmm. change is is happening i mean even without the pandemic and with the pandemic even more um so it's it's you know <laughs> one of the best parts about my job the best feeling and i've seen this with a lot of my clients is when they get it because it can take some time going through all the change and implementation but once they actually see their entire practice like this map of where all the issues are are arising it's amazing when their eyes light I'm like wow I actually have way more control and I can decide what I want to do. It really gives them that, that power to really change a lot of lives. And I think that's the best part really about population health and chronic care management is this is change on a mass scale, not just patient by patient. So it's a, it's a big picture thing, which can be overwhelming, but like we said, um, that's what we're here for to help you. Thank you. Thank you doctors for, for the answer. We do have another question. Uh, it's regards to so in regards to hardware for the devices who will be responsible for those costs so that's question number one and also when patients are not compliant what is the proper course of action so it's a, it's a two question it's a two-part question basically let me, if you don't mind, let me take, sure. let me take the hard questions. <laughs> hard questions. <laughs> hard questions. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, we, we do provide hardware and software and uh, unlimited access to supplies for patients. And that includes the device itself and as well as it includes the connectivity of the device. So our, the devices that we utilize are, are devices that have um, cellular chip technology. So they're not, again, going back to the social determinants of health. They're not contingent whether the patient uh, is at home or the patient is at a shelter, uh, whether the patient has Wi-Fi or smartphone with Bluetooth. It doesn't matter. Our devices will have internet connectivity, just like your phone. So the patient measures and it has 
the data, it has the ability to send the data to the screen of a nurse real time. And the real time aspect of it is very, very important. So not only the nurse is being able to be responsive and prevent events from happening, but also uh, every morning uh, at uh, 9 to 10 a.m., uh, the liaison, territory liaison. So if you're thinking New York, there'll be Dr. Friedel that drives the change. He would be part of the clinical rounds. So he'll hear the abnormalities from the nursing component of everything mm -hmm. that's happening in the patient population. So we, we're going to be a lot more proactive uh, and where needed reactive to address the patient before things escalate and get, they get hospitalized. But the short answer is devices will provide as well as strips if it's diabetic uh, patients and the internet connectivity. Now, um, as far as, as if the patients are not compliant, that is a huge one. And it comes with, with what the, the team has described as embracing change. So you, once you understand that you need to deploy technologies and to employ patient oversight in between office visits to prevent things from happening, you're going to drive that change and the patients will know it. So there will be initiatives, there'll be patient outreach programs, the patients will be educated, they're gonna have a lot of access, they're gonna have dedicated nurses components that are ultimately assigned to them. Every nurse uh, is assigned to specific patients and they interact with them. If it's remote patient monitoring, as frequent as every day, making sure that they're testing, making sure that the information comes through, making sure that, that we're getting the data and the patient is feeling that once they're reporting the data through the devices, the provider is reacting by modifying their medication and treatment regimens and overall improving their health and making them feel addressed and making them feel better. But it, it doesn't come easy and it takes time. And it takes time, but it, the most important is embracing that patient education component, whether that's from the outreach or through the chronic care management and remote patient monitor initiatives to change those patients over time. And uh, some may not be compliant and might, some may be depressed, and, uh, but that's what we're there for, right? We can't save everybody, but we need to try. And statistically, we improve quality over majority of the patient population. And over time, I would say, in first 90 days is going to be the first difficult time, but, but patients get used to it and they start seeing value and overall they start to see more dress and feeling better. So they will be compliant. We do, so we're actually just seven minutes from finishing, but we do have another question. Uh, are the care plans for CCM a required part of the record? Does the, uh, software, gener does the software generate or does provider write it out? No, so so Dr. Ferdell, if you yeah, can please, address please, the care plan, yeah. uh, you take that one, and, I'll, I'll, and, and also please, if please. you can take on and explain how we store phone calls within the system oh, and, and full audit trail of the record. Oh, of course, of course. Please. Um, as far as for those care plans, no, we are not there to give you extra work. That is not what we're there for. Um, the care plans are the interactions that our nurses are having with the patient. They're a monthly report. They're updated every month as the nurse is interacting with that patient monthly. So not only will you have a written record of the phone interaction with that patient, we're also going to be having all the um, data like fall assessment. Um, a medication review, all these different things. Remember we were alluding to with MIPS, those things that Medicare is looking for, all that data is there and it's all stored on our CCM EMR. So no, you do not have to write out all these reports. Those reports are available for you to review. And that's where I come in. CCM EMR education, that is uh, one of my primary goals whenever I'm with a client is to constantly reiterate how the CCM EMR works, repetition, repetition. It's, that's what it's all about. Um, as far as for listening to phone calls, they are recorded on our EMR. You have access to listen to the phone calls. So say we get, I, I can remember an example where um, this patient um, said this one thing, right? And the providers like, oh my God, this patient said that you were doing this and that, and it was horrible. And I'm like, okay, first off, let's listen to this phone call. And so we sat down together on the CCM EMR and we listened to the phone call and the story that we heard was the exact opposite. So it eliminates any hearsay. This is all cold stone facts. It's all there and you can listen to it whenever you need to. So of course, you're going to have that information at your fingertips whenever you need it. And then of course, yes, we do have our audit reports on the CCM EMR as well. So not only will um, the audit reports have the billing codes, it'll have the time that was used as well 
and also what has been done. So um, we definitely have specialists in regards to Medicare audit. Um, if I may, can I? Yeah, let, let, me, let me just weigh in if, if you don't mind, to, I don't to, mind to, 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 to what you said. So as a provider, you'll be able to select your quality measures mm -hmm. and guide the nursing component on, on the content of the interactions that they're gonna be uh, having with patients. So as an example, if, if you're an endocrinologist, the way that you're gonna to wanna to oversee the patient population is gonna be very different than if you're a um, cardiologist, right? You'll be looking for different medical care gaps. Yes, you're looking at a patient holistically, but the things that you're going to wanna to identify Screening. first would be different. As they identify these things, it gets documented in care plans. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's in the system. It's, it's a draft of a care plan. You have the functionality to approve. You have the functionality to edit. It's all easy there on the software. But I want to address that care plans have versioning. So that's a very important component. So let's just say it's the first cycle care plan and you just enroll the patient. It's going to look very different than the care plan on cycle three, cycle six, or cycle 12. It's going, to, it's going to evolve over time. So it, 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 there's many platforms out there that help you draft care plans, but you have to be very careful. If you're going to look at the care plans over time, you're going to want to see a progress. If you're an auditor, you're going to want to see evolution. You want to go, you're going to want to see how that time was spent and have you progressed clinically with this patient over time. And uh, just like Dr. Freidel said, uh, on the provider view, you're going to be able to have access to phone recordings or one click of a button uh, audits. So if you ever audited it, not only we have audit support, but, but we, you physically can go onto a platform, click a button and get the report that you need that will have full audit trail on record. Also, all this information is reviewed by our quality board as well. So what's the point of having information if it's not reviewed and making sure that everything is accurate? So that's also very important in regards to auditing. So of course, we have that quality control QAQC made up of our professional medical staff that are reviewing these medical documents monthly as well, those care plans that we've been discussing. So very important as well. Yep. And then from a, uh, I guess, quality metric perspective, there's a lot. They change every year. There's some specialty sets that you can choose, but you're not locked into that. Just because you're an endocrinologist, you don't have to choose the endocrinology sets. You can always look at all of them and pick them up that you think you're going to do better and that are going to work best for your patient population. So the, the best way, thank you, Dr. Erdig, the best way actually to handle that is we take one-on-ones once we're on board, that's part of the process, we sit down with you, we understand your specialty, we understand where you want to be on completion of 2022, we build out with you the quality expectation and the quality program for your organization, and then we, we put together a written plan of how we're going to help you implement that across the board. We will take measurements of the achievements on, on a monthly basis, quarterly basis, to make sure that when we run annual reports, they're where you expect them to be. So that gives you an ability to change strategies and to, to employ various improvement initiatives. So you're not looking at the data at the end of the year and saying, well, it is what it is, I have to report it, but you're able to drive change across the year. So it's very important to plan, measure outcomes and to evolve. Thank you, everyone. I hope that answers the question. That, Thank you. Uh, moderator, is there any yeah, other questions? We do, we do have one, when, one last word, two, two last one, questions. Let's take those last two because yeah. we have to wrap up. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So the nurses that are providing outreach, are they registered nurses? Yes. And are there specific requirements or guidance for CMS on who can provide the outreach? Absolutely, they are. Uh, you, and uh, go ahead, Dr. Erdik, I think you're best to answer that question. So from a C, if you want to take the first part, so if you want to take the first part, meaning who works as a nurse for CCM, I'll answer the second question with regards to CMS. Yeah, so, so, so it's the registered nurses that, that, that do the care management or care coordination component, yes. As, as far as who is allowed, if you can provide an answer and... Who is allowed? I think that's a question one. And who is really qualified to have the quality of the conversation and the penetration is would be my follow-up question to that. But Dr. Erdik, please go ahead. So ultimately, if the physician is captain of the boat and people qualified under the physician can provide this, 
who can bill if you if physicians can bill physician assistants can bill nurse practitioners can bill as well as clinical nurse specialists can bill for ccm services but ultimately ccm does allow for this to be uh led by a physician uh but ultimately it can be monitored by licensed practical nurses uh or just rns and cms does also allow this to be outsourced so uh, to weigh in on that, but, but as far as qualifications, you will find that people employ MAs and LPNs that work under the supervision of a physician. But if you ask us, we're going to tell you that in order for you to have the patient engagement and in order for you to properly drive outcomes, you need qualified staff. So if you're going to employ L LPNs and MAs, can you do it? Yes. Uh, are they going to have from months to months patient engagement? So we pride that we in, we're able to enroll 90 plus percent of the patient population and we're able to engage 95 plus percent of the patient population from months to months. Why? Because the patients see clinical value, the patients see clinical outcomes. So therefore they choose to continue. If you're going to employ lower end staff, clinically lower end staff, they might be great people, but they won't have the interaction with the patients at the level where patients will see value over time. So you'll find that the number of medical care gaps that they, they identify is less. Therefore, you'll find there's more dropouts out of the program. But uh, we, can, we can take that maybe uh, offline and one-on-one and -on -one give you a full description of what that I is. I mean, it is ultimately, if you know Medicare's incident two rules, it's ultimately built or furnished with regards to those rules. So anything you said, and then as long as it is incident to a physician billing, basically. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Erdik. Mm -hmm. Moderator, uh, yeah. is, is that, was that the last one? Well, we do have one more question. Do you guys want to, just one last question? If, or, if, or, if, or it's or a, if, it's, if it's a fast one, go ahead. <laughs> well, yeah, attendees are, are shooting some great questions. Thank you guys very much. So also, would you drill down on billing and reimbursement? Example, does provider get reimbursed from the plans or just bills CMS? You know, I'm sure this is a big question. Yeah, but, yes. Yeah. Uh, and we have a, 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 an expert in this. Her name is Beverly Gibson. I, I urge you to follow our LinkedIn and our website. And, and you can see pre-recorded videos with, where she drills into that. But the short answer is the provider conducts billing to the insurance plan sponsors in compliance with, with CMS and plan sponsors guidelines. But it's not a, it's not a two minute answer. So uh, again, look at our website and our, our social media profiles. You'll find a lot of good content out there by Dr. Erdik on the regulatory compliance side. There's a, a specific one on PCMH. It's an one hour. It's probably going to be one of the best hours you'll spend investing into your practice. Uh, there's one on MIPS where he drills in and explains how that functions in details. There's mm -hmm. multiple ones by Beverly Gibson and other experts that will give you the education that you need. And also I, I urge you as far as next steps, like the, the providers that, that, that think uh, that this is beneficial for their organization, whether they're independent or part of the system, feel free to reach out to Dr. Jay Swall. Uh, the process is as follows. We look at the clinical um, analysis and, and we interview, you interview us, but we interview you clinically to make sure that we're a good fit. If we think that you're clinically a good fit, then you'd get into the financial feasibility modeling, which I would be a part of, and as well as some of the other members of the team. Uh, on the regulatory side, you, you'd get the benefit of working directly with Dr. Erdik where necessary. Um, and on the implementation side, you could be working with Dr. Freidel and the rest of the team in order to make things happen. But first step is reaching out to Dr. Jayaswal. He will be looking at who would the participants were. So you might be able to connect with him and see if it's a clinically right fit. If it is, then we go through the rest of the steps and it's a very smooth, well-oiled process. But uh, that's, that would be that. Uh, Dr. Jayaswal, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we uh, would like to reach out and 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 you know offer our our best, which is the technology and also the human component. Us and our um, you know we have a federal government grant where we are doing chronic care management with with RN. So this is like 
a very good thing for your practice to have the such qualified uh, staff uh, that you can partner with. And all this is in the in under the umbrella of Medicare, wanting to um, to help you do better chronic care. Dr. Fidel, would you? Yeah, um, I would like to thank everyone for their time and their attention. Um, I look forward to meeting some of you in person in the near future, I'm sure. So um, please everyone take care. Yeah. And uh, yes, thank you. Thank you speakers. Thank you. Thank you everyone.